<laughs> and I wanted a, an illuminating but easy way out of uh, this last talk. So I made no bones about it. I'll fess up, as they say, and tell you the truth. What I'm going to read to you about the life and witness and work of St. Raphael of Brooklyn, our most recently glorified saint in the year 2000, Raphael Palawini, is verbatim the account to be found in the Word magazine, which was published in the year 2000. However, because you know I have a tendency to waffle, albeit I don't have an original thought in my head, as I've said, there will be a little off-piste uh, comments here and there. But most of the illumination is going to come from Nicholas Chapman here, who you can see, who now lives in America, who uh, is very familiar with all the Orthodox churches right across the continent. And this is not hyperbole, because, of course, his work with the uh, Holy Trinity Monastery in Jordanville takes him all over continental USA. Canada as well? Canada. There we go, Father. Not neglecting Canada. I didn't think so. Yeah. And our North America, uh, of course, our North American Archdiocese includes Canada. And, of course, our dearly, dearly beloved Archpriest Samir, um, whose great love for this saint, as shared by us all, also gives him insights, uh, which we're going to be blessed with. So at the end of this um, augmented um, reading of the Word magazine, which is, of course, our Antiochian House Journal in America, um, I'm going to have a kind of colloquium between the three of us. We're going to have a little conversation. And each of you have got a microphone there, so when we come to the point, um, you can uh, use it, please. Let's wait for my little thing to come up. Welcome to this final lecture in our Archdiocesan Conference 2016 here at the Hayes Conference Centre at Swanwick in Derbyshire. And the fifth light of Antioch is St. Raphael Hawawini, St. Raphael of Brooklyn, Brooklyn of course, New York. And this is the most recently glorified saint of the Antiochian Church uh, in the year 2000 with participation. Uh, of course, from um, the Russian tradition in, the, uh, in America, because the saint, of course, was active in and between parishes of different provenances um, in America. And this is what makes him a saint of special note, especially probably perhaps for our contemporary age and for our situation here in the West. He is given the title in America of Good Shepherd of the Lost Sheep in America, Good Shepherd of the Lost Sheep in America. And his sanctity was officially proclaimed by the Holy Synod of the Orthodox Church in America, uh, that is the OCA, on Wednesday the 29th of March in the year 2000. And in the same day he entered the Annals and Synaxarian, of course, of our Antiochian Church, as a son of Antioch, whose mission and ministry and work was du doubly blessed by ourselves, of course, and the Russians. The slide which I've shown you before, should we just wait for it to come up? Except that it's not, just bear with me. Something on the screen, Father. Yeah, let's just get rid of that. Right, thank you, Benedict. Okay, Lights of Antioch, we have seen, we have looked at, we've been blessed by, the hero martyr Ignatius of Antioch, by the preacher John Chrysostom. This not, does not limit their role within the church, but it's their effective emphasis. By the theologian St. John of Damascus, and of course by the poet of divine wisdom St. Ephraim the Syrian. Personally, if I was to characterize St. Raphael in the emphasis of his service to God, it would be of a pastor, of the Good Shepherd, of the lost sheep in America. Primarily someone who was caring sacrificially throughout his whole life for people. 
a good pastor, actually a brilliant man, conversant in several languages, theologically really well informed, but he didn't go around displaying his learning on his sleeve to impress. He used that deep divine wisdom to inform, to infuse his heart aflamed with love for the people whom he served. We now, after that introduction from myself, move into the text of the Word article from the year 2000. Okay. In the last decades of the 19th century, America received into her open arms a steady flow of immigrants from the Middle East. Known generally then as Syrians, many of these immigrants, Orthodox in faith and Arab in culture, left their ancestral towns and villages to seek new and brighter horizons for themselves in the new world. As their numbers increased in America, so too did their need for spiritual leadership. Although we do not know quite how, these struggling new Americans learned of a young, pious Syrian priest, Father Raphael Hawawini, at the time an Akamandrit and professor of Arabic language at the Kazan Theological Academy in Imperial Russia. Through the auspices of their lay leader, Dr. Ibrahim Arbili, they contacted this young priest with the request to come to America to be their shepherd and spiritual father. Several themes emerge as the story of St. Raphael's life unfold. The first is the mysterious way in which God led him from his native homeland to the shores of the American continent. The second is his submissive attitude to the providence of God. And the third is his love for the people of God. Though during his lifetime he was neither a wonder worker nor a clairvoyant elder, St. Raphael embraced a life of total abandonment of self for the service of God and his fellow man. A life of true spiritual asceticism. His message for us as we approach the end of the 20th century, remember this is in 2000, is as simple and as profound as the man who first uttered it. From St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16 and verse 24. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. St. Raphael reveals for us the royal path to salvation. He did not seek honour for himself. What is most striking is the total lack of concern for self, which is evident through his life and ministry. He followed his master. Whatever the cost, whatever the price, he followed. How heavy, however heavy the cross, however few the rewards, he followed. A brilliant man, capable of conversing in several different languages and educated in both Greek and Russian <laughs> theological schools, St. Raphael does not strike us primarily as a deep thinker or theologian, but as a good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. His writings and his sermons are eminently practical, based on Holy Scripture and his own experiences of life. He followed Christ. In the words of the prophet Isaiah, devoid of any personal agenda, he simply said, at every time and in every place, here I am, send me. Isaiah chapter 6, of course, verse 8. Here am I, send me. He exemplifies the image of a truly traditional Orthodox bishop. He received the faith from his forefathers and he sought faithfully to hand that faith over to his spiritual children. He was a great man of prayer. He loved and lived the liturgical life of the church and it was his spiritual support. He was not an innovationist. He did not change anything. He brought to his pastoral work no agenda other than to be faithful to the charge which he had received. It was the people he served who consumed his every thought and every scheme. How to reconcile enemies. 
how to restore the lapsed, how to raise the children, how to plant a mission, how to educate a priest. The legacy of his accomplishments is outstanding. He founded 30 parish churches, authored or translated 14 books, including both the small and great Eucologian, founded St. Nicholas Cathedral in Brooklyn, created and authored many articles in the Word magazine, and many other things. But these accomplishments do not reveal the true sanctity of his soul, nor do they give us the measure of the man. These are to be found rather in the lives of the people he led to Christ and to his church. The thousands who attended his funeral and paid their last respects all recognized in St. Raphael the image of the God he loved and served. Like his chief shepherd, St. Raphael laid down his life for his sheep. Like the great pastor, the Apostle St. Paul, he made up in his body that which was lacking in the sufferings of Christ. St. Paul's very bold statement into the let in the letter, of course, to the Colossians, chapter 1 and verse 24. He was not a hireling. Having loved his own, he loved them to the end. It is this love which united him to God, and it is this love which unites him to us, his spiritual children. And I'll say in parenthesis, of course, that all those written in America for Americans, I am no less a spiritual child of him, a son of Antioch, than in any other place where our beloved Orthodox pastors are to be found. He is my father and ours. Back to the script. It is this love which sanctified him, and it is this love in which he dwells in the heavenly kingdom. The words of our venerable God-bearing father, uh, John Climacus, of the latter, find their embodiment in St. Raphael to quote, Love grants prophecy, miracles. It is an abyss of illumination, a fountain of fire, bubbling up to inflame the thirsty soul. It is the <coughs> condition of angels and the progress of eternity. So Raphael was born on or near the Synaxis of the Archangels, November the 8th, 1860, to pious Orthodox Damascenes, Michael and Mariam Harawini. Due to the violent persecution of Christians in Damascus in July 1860, which saw the martyrdom of the Harawini's family's parish priest, the new hero martyr Joseph of Damascus, and hundreds of their neighbours, all commemorated on the 10th of July, Michael and his pregnant wife Mariam fled from Damascus to Beirut. It was in that city that the future saint first saw the light of day. Indeed, as the child's life unfolded, it was evident that he would have no continuing city in this world, but would seek the city which is to come. Hebrews 13, and verse 14. St. Raphael received his primary and secondary education in the parochial schools of Damascus, and his first theological training at the Ecumenical Patriarchate's Theological School at Halki in the Prince's Islands near Istanbul. He later studied at the Kiev Theological Academy in Imperial Russia. During this time, the Syro Arab community in the United States was growing at an increasing rate. A Syrian Orthodox Benevolent Society was organized in New York City, and the president, we've referred to before, Dr. Ibrahim Arbili, contacted St. Raphael, then a young priest, about, to come to the, about coming to the States. St. Raphael met, met with Bishop Nicholas in St. Petersburg, and in 1895 returned with him to the United States to serve the Syro-Arab community. St. Raphael was placed in charge of the entire Syrian Orthodox mission. He was assigned to New York City and organized the parish, which later became St. Nicholas Cathedral in Brooklyn. He supervised the development of other immigrant communities, traveling widely through the United States in 1896 to organize parishes. By 1898, St. Raphael published an Arabic language translation of the Great Eucologian for use in his churches. Later in the same year, he was to be the ranking representative of the American mission 
to Greece at Tikon, Belavin, the new diocesan bishop. At the liturgy on the 15th of December, 1898, he spoke of St. Tikon's mission in his sermon. Quote, he has been sent to tend the flock of Christ, Russians, Slavs, Syro-Arabs and Greeks, which is scattered across the entire North American continent. No philatist here. This is my interjection. This is my interposing in the text. Orthodox, pastor, bishop, Christian, sanctified soul. You say, you Romanian, you Russian, you Syrian, you Greek. Who cares? You're a human being, yes. You're Christian, yes. You're Orthodox, yes. It is you know. That's my interpolation. St. Tikon recognized his qualities and wanted St. Raphael to be one of his vicar bishops in the reorganized diocese. Now, again, an interpolation in parenthesis from me. You have to understand that at this time in America, there, was no, there were no kind of fixed ecclesiastical jurisdictional uh, setups of separate jurisdictions between the Orthodox churches. It was very much all, the, all Orthodox working together for the sake of the mission to uh, displaced Orthodox coming into America and to indigenous Americans. It was just a kind of the beginning of the idea of the Orthodox Church in America, which I won't go into. But this is the situation in which we uh, understand St. Raphael's work with St. Tikhon's work. Of course, it was Moscow Patriarchate who later returned, we know what happened, to Russia. Back to the text. <coughs> In 1903, St. Tikhon went to Russia and asked the Holy Synod to approve his plan for the election of St. Raphael as his vicar bishop. They approved St. Raphael's election and also consecrated Bishop Innocent Kustinsky as St. Tikhon's vicar bishop for Alaska. This is St. Innocent of Alaska later, of course. No, no? it's no. no. I beg your pardon. <laughs> Correct me. This is another bishop, is it? <coughs> I'm sorry, yes, of course, because we're talking about Sarah from Azarov. I always say to people in my parish, it's dates that let me down. I never seem to get in my mind dates, you know. I can remember 1066 with precious little else. This is when the Normans invaded, say, so, you know. Back to the script. Um, I remember those French. Right, on uh, the 12th of March, 1904, the solemn rite of the election of St. Raphael as Bishop of Brooklyn was performed by St. Tikhon and Bishop Innocent at the Russian St. Nicholas Cathedral in Manhattan after the vigil. The consecration took place the next day at St. Nicholas Church in Brooklyn, with St. Raphael making his confession of faith both in Slavonic and Arabic. And even as I've just said this, just to add to confusion, I meant to say, of course, not St. Seraph of Zerat, but I meant to say St. Nicholas of Japan. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> We're back now where it should be in the 1860s. I have finally located St. Nicholas of Alaska in his true period. <laughs> Following his consecration, St. Raphael continued his work among the Syrian Orthodox and also helped St. Tikhon and his successors to administer the North American mission. St. Raphael presided at the clergy conference held in Old Forge, Pennsylvania on August 2, 1905, and in the absence of St. Tikon, he also consecrated the grounds of St. Tikon's monastery in South Canaan, Pennsylvania, the first Orthodox monastery in the New World. He founded the Word magazine, the in-house journal of the Antiochians, in 1905. After 20 years of service in North America, St. Raphael fell asleep in Christ at his residence next to his cathedral on Pacific Street in Brooklyn on the 27th of February, 1915. At the time of his repose, he administered 30 congregations with 25,000 faithful. By the grace of God, we have 16 communities, parenthesis, we have 16 communities and about 1,000 faithful. Please, it may please God that the next 20 years we can match what happened with St. Raphael. Amen. Amen. While St. Raphael is remembered by historians as a learned theologian, gifted missionary, prolific translator, and writer, 
and the first to be consecrated to the sacred, sacred episcopacy in the New World, in popular piety and devotion, his memory is cherished as an icon of the Good Shepherd who collects a scattered flock, leads his lambs to a safe and verdant pasture, and ultimately lays down his life for them. Tales abound about St. Raphael's tireless ministry as a mediator and peacemaker, a support for the infirm and the aged, an encouragement to the young and disheartened, a protector of widows and orphans, a defender of the dispossessed and the poor. The scope of his self-sacrificing pastoral ministry is preserved and revealed in his own meticulously kept handwritten missionary journals which detail his transcontinental travels, travels to countless cities, villages, isolated farms and ranches in the United States, Canada and Mexico. The following vignette offers a perfect illustration of why he is known as, quote, the Good Shepherd of the Lost Sheep in North America. Once on the return trip to New York from a grueling cross-country missionary journey, St. Raphael arrived by a train in a Midwestern town late one evening and carrying his own luggage, quietly made his way to a nearby hotel to receive to await a connecting train early the next morning. Physically exhausted from several months of travel and living out of suitcases, St. Raphael found himself in the unique circumstance of not having the name or address of a single contact in the area. Thus he could at long last enjoy an evening of undisturbed and well-deserved rest. <laughs> Instead, after placing his luggage in the simple room, Saint Raphael went out to roam the dark streets, hoping to discover even one Orthodox Christian to whom he could minister. After several hours and numerous inquiries, he happened upon a handful of young, young Orthodox Arabs and joyfully spent the entire night and the early morning hours comforting them in their loneliness, offering them fatherly counsel and advice, instructing and encouraging them in their faith and hearing their confessions. Only at the last moment did he reluctantly leave their company in order to rush back to the hotel, retrieve his suitcases and hurry to his train. Out of breath, he arrived at the station in time to board the train as it pulled away from the platform. But before he closed his eyes to steal a few minutes of rest on the crowded and noisy train, Sir Raphael carefully inscribed in his notebook the names and addresses of his newfound spiritual children, placing next to each a notation of what he promised to send, to one a prayer book, to another an icon, to yet another a prayer rope, and to all assurance of his paternal love, prayers and blessings. After his repose in the law, the sacred relics of St. Raphael, the Good Shepherd of the Lost Sheep in America, were first interred in a crypt beneath the Holy Table at his St. Nicholas Cathedral in Brooklyn, New York, later interred in the Syrian section of Brooklyn's Mount Olivet Cemetery on April 2, 1922, and finally translated to the Holy Resurrection Cemetery at the Antiochian village near Ligonier in Pennsylvania on the feast of the Dormition of the Theotokos 1988. His sanctity was officially proclaimed by the Holy Synod of the Orthodox Church in America on the 29th of March in the year 2000, and his glorification was celebrated on the 29th of May at St. Tikon's Monastery. So that is the article that appeared in the Word magazine. And of course what we remark from this, and the first thing that we observe, is that his mission was endorsed and blessed by the hierarchies respectively of the Church of Antioch and the Church of Moscow. And the, this was the early days of the building of the Orthodox Church in America.
before of, before of course the Russian Revolution intervened and the whole thing subsequently collapsed as some <laughs> Orthodox bishops of a later generation decided that they wanted to uh, provide their own uh, dioceses for persons of their own background, culture and language. And um, we have what we have and that situation is as it is. Um, and in love and in truth and in common work we're now seeking God's will and way to really kind of, in, in, in a way, recapture some of that idealism of uh, establishing an Orthodox Church in each place of the West where Christians, Orthodox Christians are to be found and where the mission of the Church is to be involved. Of course, this, as Seidner has explained in, in reference to Crete, is a long and complicated process. Uh, but one thing that is truly to be cherished, and this is a personal statement in the Orthodox Church, is that we don't ride roughshod over people. We don't just sort of say, this is the kind of church you've got to have, and that's it, like it or lump it. We don't do that. We respect people's desires, wishes, insofar as they can be harnessed to the love of God. Of course, we discern that which is primary and secondary in these matters. But the important thing is, we are an organic church, a church of families. We're not a regiment, a battalion of people always marching in step. Forgive that little personal statement saying that I hope it's reasonably accurate. And this is what I cherish anyway about the Orthodox Church, its respect for persons. I would like now, just before we have our little question and answer session, to have this little colloquium between the three of us because there is represented here in Nicholas and Father Samir much greater wisdom on the matter of St. Raphael than I possess. I come to love him, as it were, from afar by reading his life, but precious little else. Uh, however, um, the two of you have much more uh, resource within you uh, to uh, enlighten the man and his significance for the Orthodox Church and for the Church of Antioch in particular. Perhaps I can start with Nicholas. Nicholas, what particularly about... St. Raphael, do you cherish and value in his work for the Kingdom of God? I should preface the answer by saying St. Raphael served the first Orthodox liturgy in the Bar for America, uh, where I live. Uh, we're still trying to track down exactly where in the city this was, but uh, just over 100 years ago. And I think that the most striking thing, which is the characteristic ultimately of any missionary, is perseverance perseverance and hard work and a lot of prayer. And I think what needs to be understood is a little bit about uh, the history of the syro lebanese community in, in, in North America. Broadly speaking, you have two major ports of entry, uh, Ellis Island, New York City, everybody tends to think about. The other one people tend not to think about so much as New Orleans in the yeah. south. Mm -hmm. uh, and both of these were, were centers of migration. <coughs> Uh, and the, it seems from talking to various people and studying and so on that uh, a tremendous number of the early immigrants of Syria Lebanese background were actually like my ancestors, the name Chapman means traveling peddler. And they were mostly peddlers. And they would get off the boat, you know, simply, uh, and manage to buy some things in New York City or in New Orleans, and then get on the train and head inland somewhere and see if they could sell it for a higher price in land than they bought it for in New York. And some of them got quite rich over time uh, with that. So when we hear about St. Raphael traveling on the train, it's a bit like he's actually chasing the, <laughs> chasing the people from the port. And, and, he, and he's learning as he travels, uh, you know, because one community moved to Utica, which is where we are now, which is on the train these days, five hours, probably it was faster back then. Uh, so he would follow them, then he would hear so this story that Father Gregory quoted about the, the young men in the middle of the night, I'm sure St. Raphael would have had some notion that there were people in that town. He didn't just chance upon them completely. He wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't have gone out looking. He had some pre-intelligence. Uh, pre uh, the other thing is the extent of his ministry, uh, because Father Gregory went, mentioned he went to Mexico, and I'm going to try and sell your book later on, uh, as the story is in here. There's a Spanish general book here. There's only one copy left. Um, there's a, a, Spanish, a Spanish general uh, is traveling with, um, with the Russian consul from Madrid in Mexico and they meet St. Raphael. 
um, and the Spanish general ends up converting to orthodoxy, this is in 1911, and sponsoring the publication of the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom in, in Spanish, uh, which the priest, Father Eugene Smirnoff in London, uh, then arranges to send to St. Raphael in Brooklyn uh, for the Spanish language mission. So, yes, St. Raphael was, was ministering primarily to the Syro Lebanese community, but he was already considering not only Mein al Kalamath, the word was first published in Arabic, that gradually introduced English, but already, even in his time, he was beginning to use both Spanish and, and English in the services. Uh, as Father Gregory said, he was, he is, another thing which isn't, I think, really hasn't been picked up on yet, and I'm, there's two more book commercials coming. Uh, he, he was at the Kazan Theological Academy in Russia, and, and you have to understand, this is, Kazan is the fruit of a man called Nikolai Ilminsky, who I hope you'll be seeing a book about sometime in the next five years, and really is the primary missionary of Central Asia. So there's a great concern in Kazan for t Turkic, Arabic, the whole Middle East and Central Asian world, and St. Raphael is the fruit of that school. Uh, also, another aspect of St. Raphael, which I only became aware of this year, uh, when I, I was, on, I had to come to a funeral here, and the chief ticket was via Istanbul. Uh, and when he was at Halki, uh, he wrote his dissertation on, on ecclesiology, on the nature of the church. And God willing, the English translation of that will be published and available again within the next three, three years or so. So really, uh, the, the extent of his mission, uh, there's a whole, another question that maybe Father Samir can speak to more of his background, even before Russia, with with Jerusalem, but uh, he, he, he had fingers and lots of pies, let's say. Father Samir, what are your reflections about this great saint? I have not been to primary sources about that, but it's just um, going through the same article which Father uh, has uh, started with it, but I was very much touched by his fatherly impulse, what I mean by that. Uh, he felt that all those who left the Middle East, uh, Lebanon and Syria, and there were uh, a <coughs> search for a place where to, uh, to live, uh, and uh, not helped by anybody, uh, just because they couldn't live anymore there. First World War, for example, and beforehand. Uh, the description is that they were really like orphans, and he was like a father for them. And this fatherhood was actually a, a consequence of his uh, love, love as a pastor. Uh, he, he knew some families, not people who are there, but the families which were in his country before leaving to Kazan and Belgrade. And this is how he took care of them there. Uh, he, he had uh, in mind to uh, found parishes exactly as they appear, by bringing families together and then helping them. Uh, it seems that they were uh, gathered all and they used to communicate with each other and that was the force, you see, of uh, growing further on there, help each other. And uh, he, he knew how to deal with that. Here because myself, uh, I have uh, and the years I passed in Romania, discovered the other, if you want, ethos of our rich orthodoxy. We have the Greek one, if we can speak about it, and it is 
well pronounced in the way each uh, church or each people uh, pass on the, uh, the revealed uh, truth and the tradition itself. And there is what we call the Slavophilites, the Russian and then the other family with them, Bulgarian and after that Romania. Um, and every part of them have got a way of expressing the orthodox spirituality. Uh, if we have, for example, uh, my life in Christ, if we read that book. Uh, and we notice there uh, how much the um, uh, Russian spirituality have been expressed by a priest. And uh, the Jesus prayer, uh, the whole uh, Russian philosophy, I presume that Saint, uh, Saint uh, Nicholas was uh, gifted with the spirit of Kazan's university. They had something in those times, the Russians, uh, which pushed and all sorts of other countries from Asia, as Brother Nicholas here emphasized upon it, uh, they have the spirit of missionarism. Salib al Juzi, the well known Palestinian who also went and studied in Kazan, when he came back, he was so knowledgeable that he could write. Uh, a book that today uh, Shia and Sunni, especially Shia Muslims, go and refer to it. And during the first times when in Iraq was still monarchy, it was adopted by the government. Why? This famous Salib al Juzi and an orthodox, taking the orthodox spirituality from there, he, he succeeded to understand how faith should be nurtured. And this is how he took the history of that confession and presented it in a way that pleased not only to the Shia people, but to all others who wanted to know about Shia. This is an example to, know, to say that uh, some factors were um, uh, all together put in, uh, there in those times in order to make of missionary life uh, like a balsam to, uh, to internal wounds. It, it, it is so something which, out of love, you can rescue a lost person. Emigrating people are lost people at the beginning when they live in a foreign country. And all what they need, exactly what uh, it has been given to them, either there in Kazan or in uh, Brooklyn by Santa Rai. So, I don't know if I can stress that more useful. than this. Yeah, that's time. a very useful form. Um, perhaps at this point, uh, continuing this tripartite approach <coughs> for the next five or ten minutes, um, we can offer the subject to the floor for people to uh, ask comments, questions about the life of St. Raphael, those particular combination <laughs> of circumstances that you've referred to, which makes it Kairos, God's time, for someone to be raised up to advance the mission of the church. You know, we can say that lots of things need to be done, X, Y, and Z, A, B, C, D, and E. We can all make a list of them, write them on two sides of A4, but it may not be God's time. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So from the floor, Father George. Yes, I was interested uh, in your opening remarks when you said that St. Raphael is recognized as a saint, although he was not in his lifetime a wonder worker, no miracles attributed to him. He was not a clairvoyant, he could not read people's minds. Mm -hmm. He was simply a man who was fired by love. I just wonder, I don't know the answer to this, have there been any miracles since his repose? Father Samir, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, Say it to you. I think there has, hasn't there? I think there has. Can I ask you? Yes. Father Book said that if you use the microphone. I will chat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> In our Orthodox Church, not in Catholic, a saint doesn't have to be uh, have a miracle in his life or anything else or vision or to see dreams whatever we have some of them for sure but in our church the main idea to be a saint to live life, life like saint life how is it with the, with the Holy Spirit <coughs> So we can all be saints without miracles. We can all be saints without doing anything <coughs> or whatever. <laughs> the main idea to that to be saints is that your heart is with God. Give it to God, you will be saint. When priests ending their services, what they say. No, no. Live home to my own father. Through the prayers of our holy fathers. He whom are holy fathers, not just just the father of the church. All you are in the church, our holy fathers. With you all, with your prayer of of all of you, we are ending our service. So, to be sent, just <coughs> one thing, give your heart to, your, to God, and He will make you a sin. And after that, no sins, and with confession, if you have a little bit of sin, you can remove it. So, you can face God. And he will ask you, son, what you have done in your life? I will leave the answer for each of us. For each of us. You will answer the God, not me. I will answer my mind. So, in canon law of the Orthodox Church, sense means giving heart. Uh, in Catholic Church, recently, about 10 or 15 years ago, they make saints in level. So, if the saint had done a, a miracle, so, okay, we, they name, I don't know the names now in English, but they have three names for saints. Saint do miracles, saints are martyrs, saints whatever can I see. Saint George, they make, make uh, they put him down a little bit because he does not make miracles for people <laughs> around. Him. He's just a martyr. So that he made, made the, no in our church no levels. Mm -hmm. If God accepted any one of us a saint, he is saint. Love. It's in our hand. If we could give our heart, if we would make a good confession to all of us. Thank you, Sir. I should have brought this out for the original question, but you were quite audible. Uh, <laughs> Any other questions, please? <coughs> 
One moment, please. Thank you, Father Gregory. Um, I, I entirely agree with what you said at the beginning about pilotism. And also, we're quoting from my side, here I send me. And my mind keeps thinking about that very challenging subject, matter, which is planning for the succession. And what, what we are experiencing at the moment, in some ways, is very much, I think, what was happening in America at the time that um, St. Raphael was called there. He, he was called from abroad. That they sent him to the new office. And we're thinking all the time about how we can identify people in the next generation. And I wonder if that will be restricted in a way, not through conscious choice, to people who are in the country at the moment, um, who, are, who are of ethnic descent and elsewhere, or homegrown, or, or whether we might still be looking for bringing people in to be our new pastors. Thank you, uh, Philip. Did everybody hear his question? <laughs> Okay. I don't want to put Saida on the spot and say, can you bring some more Syrian and Lebanese uh, brothers and sisters over, you know, but, hmm? no, you will not. No. <laughs> <laughs> they are asking. They are asking. <laughs> <laughs> but we need uh, the people uh, from here yeah. to be priests and yeah. not. We need the people from here to be priests, to be teachers. You remind me of that. And after me, when I will die, I never be. Yes. So that the succession is for you as much as it is for anyone else. So, here am I, send me, is something we say here, now. Please, it. May it please stop. Yes? Here am I, send me. With that, Sadna, with your blessing, I think we will conclude the conference. I'll say something uh, briefly. Um, thanks be to God. I'll just conclude the recording. This is the end of.